So, my name is Roar Kellerman. I'm an engineering fellow responsible for data centers and hyperscale systems. In the past, over five years ago, when I was working at eBay, I was challenged by executive management to take an eBay's architecture, which was at that time looking like an old dinosaur in the term of the storage uh, manager, and make it revolutionize. And as I got successes there, they turned to me and said, we have a large big data infrastructure. How do you make that revolutionary? How do you change our fraud detection? How do you change our analytics, our e-commerce? How do you do all this and put Flash in it? And with all the successes I was having with Flash, I was thinking, yeah, this is going to be great. I'm going to be able to do this. I come down, I talk to the big data guy, all the uh, data warehousing, all the anal analytics folks. And then I realized the industry is not ready for Flash four years ago. And the reason my engineering associates came here and gave you what they gave you was to give you the story that until networking, until compute, until all the other ancillary stuff catches up, there's only so much storage and flash can help analytics. And since this is a flash company, I wanted to focus on what can we do for analytics? What can we do? And what we're doing today because of the rest of the infrastructure, we're actually changing the use cases, the capabilities. And, and that's what I want to get through today. So one of the things I want to say, I'm not going to go through this in too much detail. There's two links in the slide deck if you guys want. These are performance perspective of big data, of Flash on Hadoop. And what I want to do is I pulled out two slide decks from this paper, but this is publicly available. You can click on this and, and take a look at it. And the first one, and it's a little hard to see, so if you go to the link, you'll be able to follow on, is the traditional SATA drive, SATA with one SSD for temporary, and then all SSD. And what you'll notice is that there's a very... There's a 3x difference in performance in the shuffle and map reduce phase for Hadoop in Terrasort. And again, not every single Hadoop workload is going to get that performance benefit because there are those that are I.O. bound versus those that are storage bound. But the key that I wanted to show is that there are the advantages of Flash. But the question is, can you deploy Flash in these workloads effectively and economically? And Two, three years ago, the answer was no. As things move forward, again, this is just another very telling slide as you look the big on single SATA drive, on five SATA drives, again, it just shows you how many drives you need to match the SSDs. <clears throat> and in Hadoop, and again, I'll, I'll challenge any no SQL, if you want to talk about Cassandra, if you want to talk about any type of analytic software, I, I've deployed almost every single one of those. Um, unlike some of my peers, I came from the operations side of the world where we did a lot of deployments. I worked with the data scientists, I worked with a lot of the different databases and analytics folks, so the pain points were very near and dear. So the, one of the problems is, and I don't know if, uh, if you guys have the same experiences, but a lot of the applications can handle a drive down. You know, drive down is a matter of just redistributing the data. But when the compute is down, you lose either 50% of your cube compute or, or one third of your compute. Because usually there's three replicas and each replica is on a compute and you want to distribute your data on that compute or that rack with that compute on it. So you lose uh, storage availability and you lose compute availability until that compute is re repaired. And again, a compute down is an amount of storage. If you have eight drives, 12 drives, whatever amount of drives, you lose that amount of capability. A rack down is usually a very impactful thing in a lot of these areas. And what you want to do is you want to move away from, even though rack down is handleable, nobody really wants to handle a rack down. It is a major impact. And God forbid a uh, uh, distribution layer switch down or even you know, any of your other infrastructure down. And this is just a repeat, just I wanted to reemphasize. When you look at the cost point, 
when you talk to people and that's hard drive based, they're going to tell you six to nine cents. But when you look at the cost model, when you factor in compute and the server costs, it almost doubles depending on how many you're buying. You're going from a six to nine cents SATA hard drive and you factor in the compute on it, you're now 15 to 30 cents, depending if you're buying thousands or if you're buying only hundreds. And so when you take that cost and you replicate it, you're now in the 45 to 90 cents and hard drives. The one thing that the ops team that I worked with have always said when you deal with petascale, tens and hundreds of petabytes of this type of situation, operational fatigue. Day in, day out, all they do is repair. So what we've proposed, and again, this is going to the use case of why this matters, is this new deployment model where because of the density of flash, where we're literally at the same density level as your biggest disk, eight terabytes, I mean, you have eight terabytes drives today from HGST and others, and 10 terabytes is coming up, but our device today is eight terabytes and we could easily go to 16, or, uh, 16 terabytes whenever anyone asks us for it. We're able to, because of the change in form factor, we could actually go to any size we want because we're unbridled by the folding technology or anything else. It's just we didn't believe anyone wanted 16 terabytes in a drive card at the moment. Though we're being proved wrong as, as we go to a lot of these large customers, they want it. And once you hear about some of the use cases I'm talking about, you'll see why. So think about it this way. If you look at it where you aggregate all your storage into one area, and you now can separate your servers, your analytics side separately, you now have the ability to grow your storage independent from your analytics. You can now burst up your analytics if you need it or burst it down if you don't need it. You could also right size instead of doing the traditional storage with compute and grow linearly. You can now right size the compute from your storage. And that really breaks apart your environment because now the bus that you're using, which is the network, has moved from 1 gigabit, 10 gigabit, end of the year 25 gigabit by transceiver change, 50, 100 gigabits, next 18 months, three years, you're at 400 gigabits. So the bus is now the network. And the media, because spitting media drives, I mean, if you had the, the fastest tailwind on a SATA drive, you might be able to hit 180 megabytes per second, as long as there's no crosstalk or whatever. With lots of crosstalk, in fact, with a queue depth of 16 to 32, flash devices can hit a throughput of over 400 megabytes per second, up to 500. In fact, with large block throughput, our InfiniFlash box can actually, with 6G SAS, we can hit 8 gigabytes per second measured. With 12G, we can look at 16 gigabytes. If you just take that and measure the ratio, you can do 48 servers to one InfiniFlash box. Or if you took two InfiniFlash box and got one petabyte, you could service 98 servers. So when you look at a model like this, where you put two InfiniFlash for one petabyte and put a dense view, the servers just hasn't caught up in density. But instead of doing a 32 cores to 12 drives, these can be higher core devices having more analytics capability, denser capabilities with flash, being able to service it at a much faster ratio with less impact on ingest, less impact on rebuild. And the whole aspect is because it's a tier or a whole storage, it's primary storage, not a cache, you can now move data to lower cost, three cents a gigabyte, 5.9K drives, SMR drives, and manage the IO on those drives so it's streaming reads or writes. And, and who would care? Video surveillance, advent of 4K cameras, 98% compression, that's 20 megabytes per second streaming throughput per camera. Multiply that out by thousands of camera. The writes on hard drive, at, you know, if you're lucky, sequentially, if it's all coming down sequentially, you'll be able to write it. But reading it, multiple cameras sequentially going on a hard drive, real time, it's fragmented. Writing is all sequential, but once you read it, the fragmentation of how it's written, because it's first come, first serve, 
you're not going to get the same throughput. And once you start deleting the data because it's and you've moved it over or, or you've deleted because it's expired and you want to now add more data, now your file system's fragmented unless you go off and format it and then redo it. And then how do you do analytics on data that you just stored? Because you don't want to just take surveillance footage, store it, and then only look at it if there's an event. You want to start doing analytics. Everyone we've talked to wants to take the retention period on video surveillance, make it longer, and then do analytics on it. So and cameras do analytics at the camera level to do facial recognition and other things. But it's the mix of the cameras from one critical infrastructure like a nuclear power plant with other nuclear power plants around the country. If you see the same face within six months across five nuclear facilities and they're not employees, that should trigger something. But right now you can't do that. Because there's no way to be able to analyze. Everyone's storing data on hard drive and analyzing from that is a problem. So in this model, InfiniFlash can handle the ingest of that data. It can handle the migration of that data. It can handle the read of the data. So the, the whole aspect is when you have data that has high value and that value diminishes over time, and then you have a long tail where there's spikes in value based on events, a tiered model is perfect with InfiniFlash in the front end. What you end up having is a tier of high value time data in the front end, handling the ingest, handling the read and the analytics of that. And then as it moves down to the lower end aspect of the long tail, spinning media, three cents a gigabyte. And all of a sudden you now need to access something from there because you want to see if, if this event happened three months ago, nine months ago. Well, what ends up happening is you can tell InfiniFlash, don't migrate, don't batch move anything while I'm reading this data. Now you've made all those spinning media drives just do sequential reads or sequential writes and no cross traffic at all. And only because InfiniFlash has the capacity as a tier. If it was a cache, you wouldn't be able to do that. And the aspect is when you look at spinning media drives at six to nine cents aggr aggregated across a large deployment, your average could be about 60 cents a gigabyte, 75 cents. Let's just state that. You look at InfiniFlash, we publish that we're about a dollar gigabyte or less. And as your procurement is higher, the cost, of course, is economically will go lower. When you look at erasure coding and all the ad addition, and then you say, 60 days on InfiniFlash and 180 days on this low cost tier, your average cost for that deployment is now less than 40 cents a gigabyte. And in the video surveillance market, 50 to 60 cents is the sweet spot. And now you've been able to do higher fidelity, higher capabilities with analytics capabilities in video surveillance. Now take that into other types of analytics workload. Think about e-commerce, seasonality. Think about the, uh, the different use cases where you want to have your high cost data in front where there's a high ingest rate. And that ingest rate in a standard Hadoop environment could potentially slow you down because it's now impacting the actual analytics you're doing. Remember, the crosstalk of a hard drive is problematic. We've measured that when you do both reads and writes on a hard drive, on our InfiniFlash uh, cards, the impacts for the reads and writes are less than 20%. So you're not taking a 120 megabytes per second, 180 megabytes per second hard drive and doing shuffle phase, uh, temporary storage, ingest, and then of course doing your work on it. And though those are crosstalk, on InfiniFlash, you could do all that without impact. Now, Th this is, I, d I like the story that you've got there, I think, around why you would have it on Flash. One thing that I am sort of struggling with a little bit is that's true of any Flash. Yes, but today the problem, and th we've modeled this out multiple times. In fact, I'll, I'll go back to this slide. But when you look at the density aspect of Flash, the, the most dense Flash today is, R, is um, SanDisk 4 terabyte Optimus Max drive at 4 terabyte at 2.5 inch form factor. 
because even within our own flash we're cheaper than our own max drives the density aspect of eight terabytes is actually the reason we picked it was it's that transition point where compared against a two to four terabyte hard drive the density and the rack reduction and the power reduction this up here is the operational expense over three years compared to this for power and space when you look at it it's 30 percent increase in initial acquisition costs but you reclaim it within the first year and then the next two years you're actually cheaper in operating that device and that does not include the cost for licensing if you can burst your compute up and down if you if you don't need as much compute as you need storage then you don't have to pay for all the different compute nodes because now you're only licensing compute, you're not licensing the back, the back end storage. So the cost reduction for that, the cost reduction for the fact that your operational aspect, at, at one tenth the uh, failure rate, the, the ratio I like to state is that uh, at the same deployment ability at 80 petabytes, you would be repairing anywhere between 15 to 30 drives a week. Whereas in InfiniFlash, you'd be playing one ice card. So if you're going to replace the same sweep, a weekly sweep of 15 to 30, you could wait 15 weeks before you do one sweep to repair 15 ice cards. And the fact that it's erasure coded, it allows you to have a rack level failure without data availability problem. Whereas today, if you have a rack level failure, you've lost access to one third of your data if you have no DR or 50% of your data if you do two local and one remote. Mm. So what is the power reduction? Because that's one issue with high density is that you end up chewing up a lot of KVA. Five kilowatts of hard drive versus four kilowatts of InfiniFlash using at a two petabyte deployment. And so what, if I maxed out a rack, how much, how many KVA? So, so here's the in? interesting thing. If you look back here, having Two InfiniFlash gives you one petabyte. The way we deploy this today, one petabyte of storage is only uh, five rack, uh, ten rack units. If you do two petabytes in the same rack, that would be a total of ten rack units. Actually, yeah, ten rack units. No, it would be twenty rack units. So when you look at two petabytes and twenty rack units, and let's say you use a Dell FX server above it, where you can put two to four servers into you. You have 48 servers in the other 24 rack units. So in a, in a 48 server plus two petabytes of storage, that's denser than most people's enterprise grade deployment. At a standard one rack unit, 16 core with uh, 12 drives, you only have one petabyte in a rack with 48 servers. Yeah, I'm sorry, what I, was, what I was thinking is I could just fill racks full of storage and then have an interconnect across to my compute nodes that live in a total other bit part of the data center yeah, so that I'm scaling both of them independently. Right, yes. but what's the power requirement for putting that much density in one rack? Do you know what the KVA are for? For the InfiniFlash or yeah. for the compute? Uh, for the InfiniFlash. Oh, for the InfiNiFlash, it's less than eight kilowatts, easy. Okay. So when you look at putting the two compute in front of a half a petabyte, it's less than 700 watts. And it really depends on how much compute you really need to put in those servers. They're just providing data node only services with erasure coding capability. So you're not looking at more than maybe six to eight cores per server, two servers per InfiniFlash. So it's really low power usage. In fact, the, one of the key values we give to the enterprise, especially since everyone has power and uh, space concerns, is the fact that we take less space and we're less power for your data storage, so that in a model where you intersperse it physically with the compute within the same rack as the storage, so you have more fault domains for the storage, you actually can have a balanced power profile. So four petabytes of InfiniFlash frees up a lot of kilowatts based on a hard drive based system. Again, 
use up about one to two kilowatts, and now you can put those into your dense compute. Yeah. And with Haswell, higher core with better wattage capability, better than Sandy Bridge, now you can do a very dense profile. You, tr you try to do that with drives, you need more drives to be able to use those cores. But again, that's a similar story that you get from other flash vendors. But so. they don't have eight terabytes. To be able to yeah. do that, yeah. To be able to do that, they're, they're going to need to have a lot more servers. Mm. You know, the, the densest 2U box have only 24 two and a half inch form factor slots. Yeah, what, what I, I guess what I'm getting at is rather than having it be flash is good because X um, is to try to find out from what's unique and special and great about your thing, particularly as it relates to data and analytics. So the story you were telling before about so, um, so our streaming 4K video and then being able to analyze that online without it having to go off to another tier or off to tape, that's a great story. Yeah. Um, do you have more of those that we could hear about? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, again, that, that's what I'm going to be talking about. Cool. I just wanted to give you guys this view of the, you know, this is some of the things that you're looking at. One-tenth failure rate, again, the uh, power savings, the distribution. You know, Alan was saying 20-25%, but we could actually go as low as 15 or even 10% if you have a wide enough data distribution model. And, uh, and everything here, the, the key here is if you look, and again, remember, any flash can potentially do this. The, the key is our flash is lower cost, higher density than anyone in the in industry today. And we're planning to keep that leadership as we move forward. And we're also creating key IP. And, and this is one thing we didn't have. We, we don't have a software stack to show you where we actually have a data optimization layer. It's called our SDK Plus, where we add optimization layer that you could put below your application. So for like for Cassandra, we're able to make Cassandra perform faster. For MongoDB, we're able to make them perform faster because our SDK Plus allows you to take those NoSQL applications and put them on steroids basically. Make them optimal for Flash because a lot of these NoSQL are developed specifically for hard drives. So when you start looking at it, when you look at this, yes, Flash can get here. Once our competitors start making 8 terabyte drives, we're on to the next thing and we will start showing you every six months, we will continue giving you guys capabilities that will continue to change. We, we're, one of the things we have to worry about is if we're the only ones doing this, a lot of the hyperscale customers will say, I want two sources. So if we're too busy being the only source for this and the only model for this, we're not going to get wide adoption because we're, we're going to be a one-stop shop. So the key here is we know our competitors will get here. Whether it's with 8 uh, terabyte density or, or with 2 or 4 terabytes with lower cost, they're going to get to this model and we want them to. So that we're not the only play, but at the same time we're the ones with the cost, economic, and density value and as we move forward as they catch up to us we will have more disruptions and more capabilities so I want to be able to give you something to think about because the next time you're here you're gonna hear things where we're treating flash in the industry as flash today everyone in the industry treats flash as hard drives from the form factor two and a half inch from the failure models of flash from you know all the way they talk about flash we, we have key patents that we're, we'll be releasing in the near future that will change the way people handle flash so that it's actually handled like flash and, and there's a, and I'll give you guys a hint there's a reason why we call it infinite flash okay and so let's talk I, I don't have any more slides that I wanted to go through because I want to talk about use cases what else you can use this for and I don't want to put slides there because a lot of this is going to be more uh, discussion oriented so one of the things that we're talking to in a lot of our customers is what's called edge to core computing when you look at data collection you know pick commerce pick uh, banking pick any industry there's usually data collection at the edge there is some type of reduction of that data and it moves closer to the core and then it moves closer to the core but at the amount of data people want to do they're losing data every time they do that leap because they have to reduce it because there's only so much when you can do 
and they're introducing delays. Yeah, yes, and, and, and one example would be like, let look at you know, an, a, a, a commerce shop, a more brick and mortar store. Th they have video surveillance coming in. They, they usually only have half a rack of capabilities. They have transactions, they have inventory, they have all this stuff. And guess what? The center office wants to have a lot of that data. But the WAN is the problem. Well, how much easier it is to just pull eight terabyte cards, grab a box and ship it. That's way faster, that's higher bandwidth, even though it may take 24 hours, you're still able to ship. Just give you an example. A rack full of InfiniFlash with the compute of it, that's six petabytes. When we go to a, a 16 terabyte card, that's 12 petabytes in a rack that you could forklift up, send a rack from one area to another area within a very short period of time. But we're also, I mean, with a lot of these problem cases we're also trying to find ways to move the compute out to the edge but the rather edge, than transferring all the data the problem to with the edge is that the edge usually does not have the power That's the space yep. and mm -hmm. now with the density of infiniflash at the edge a 3u box can now handle all your storage for video surveillance for inventory for databases even for local analytics when you look at two petabytes in t uh, 10 rack unit or 20 rack units, you have half a rack. You now have put four servers in front, Dell FX servers with two to four servers per 2U. You've got eight to 16 servers, virtualize it. Now you have databases, inventory management, video surveillance, and a virtualized analytics so that when customers come in and you can see who they are because your video surveillance camera triggers who they are and you, you already have a list of all these people, they can then come back and say, oh, this guy likes to buy X, Y, and Z because I have it all in my store. And once you have that data, SMS him, and now he's got, oh, guess what? Three things I like is on sale, walking in the door. You know, these are things that is enabled by the density and performance that you can do by the fact that InfiniFlash can now, in a half a rack, give you something that normally in a standard industry would take you two racks to be able to do. And so, you know, think of oil and gas. Think of uh, video editing. When you look at the amount of data that's generated when you're doing, you know, filming 4K cameras, and you're filming all this, and then you need to do local editing because you don't want to send everything back to the studios to do editing. The solutions out there today are like the, in the five to ten dollars a gigabyte, and they're using compression and dedupe and all this other stuff. We can do the same thing at significantly lower cost without compression and dedupe. And the fact that InfiniFlash is all SSD and it's there. You can put it on a car, drive around with it with a camera, and then as long as you can handle your mouse properly, you could be editing while you're doing that. <laughs> so again, it just opens up the possibilities of things that you can do that in the past you couldn't do before. Yeah, and that's that's the more interesting story. Oh, around, I, I, around there, I have more. If you have time, we can go into a lot more use cases because what we found when we first came out, we said it was analytics, it was data repository that we went in for. When we announced the, the, the product back in March, less than 10 weeks ago, everything out of the word work just started coming out and people saying, hey, could you do this? Can you do this? You know, we, we have so many people asking for so many different things. Our marketing team, I, I don't know if they're getting any sleep or not. Well, that's, the, the thing is that no one else, like everyone talks about TCO and, and cost leadership and blah, 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 and quite, I don't care. A, you're all wrong. Um, because you all calculate it differently and it's all designed yes. to make your thing special. And the other part is that I don't buy Flash because it's cheap. It's not what it's for. Yep. I want to do this other, this other sort of thing. Like, so what you're talking about, the fact that I can now run complex analytics out at the edge, yep. because before I couldn't put the power into that site. Yep to run the disks that I needed. And so, so it's not so much about the density per se, but I can get dense storage with low power. And the fact that it's not that much more expensive, mm -hmm. the value I get out of it, mm -hmm. that's what makes the sale. Well, that's why I want to do it, because it's incredibly valuable. But before it was cost prohibitive for multiple other reasons. It wasn't just, oh, the disks are expensive. So now I can do things that I could not do before. 
that's far more interesting than, oh, these are cheaper than hard disks. Oh, I, I completely. In fact, we're not here to replace hard drives. If you hear my story, we're displacing hard drives. We're moving them where we think they need to be. Yeah. You know, and again, I'll give them 20, 30 more years. I don't care. I believe that where flash needs to be is in primary storage to enable new sets of things. I mean, we didn't even talk about fraud detection. The whole aspect of object storage makes fraud detection easier. The problem is all object storage is slow. So when you look at our object storage models, we have super fast, high performance reads because it's on flash. And it's not just flash, you know, with our object storage, it's we optimize the object storage for our flash. And there's a lot of other things that you could look at, you know, there's oil and gas. How much data do they throw away because locally on an oil rig the vibration will kill most hard drives and you know and the fact is they need to store this data so they throw most of it away because they just don't have the capacity to store it. But if you're able to just take you know two four petabytes of this in half a rack and just stream data to it and while you're streaming you're analyzing because you can easily less than 20 percent impact. There's a huge use case as well around the, the contribution of renewables to energy grids Yes. because you need to be able to process and analyse in real time at the edge to start anticipating what you have to do with your nuclear plants and your coal plants that will take 24 hours to shut down. But the, see that's the, that's the question. There, there's this whole idea of real time, near real time and then batch processing yes, offline. It's, and it's, it's near enough rather than exactly. real. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And because the key for, if you really want real time you have to have the flash in as a memory replacement. And our product is not that. Our product is near real time. It's good enough. Mm -hmm. And I, we believe the window there is large enough that we can handle most of those. So, again, questions? We can continue the discussion on use cases later. I just want to know if there's any questions. I mean, I, I believe I helped tie in what uh, Fritz and Alan stated earlier. The whole key here is we've opened up and facilitated new ideas, new deployment capabilities, and use cases that, as you said, is very compelling once you look at what it can enable. Mm.